So now we're just going to basically get into a bit of a discussion about the various documents that are out there and available in the market. And I'm going to run through a little bit of a comparison of some of the advantages and disadvantages of the various ones regarding the key elements that Howard has pretty much covered for what's essential for an IPD agreement. The um, handout materials, and I believe this is posted on the website, um, the USGBC website, there's a comparison chart that goes along with a paper that I drafted with the other folks in the office that, that discusses these various agreements. But the comparison chart's particularly um, good because it's, a, it's in a spreadsheet, which most contractor and engineer types like. And it just goes over those key points. And it becomes very clear as to which agreement might be the right agreement for your project. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, these documents, this is a, this, we consider these AIA documents. Um, Transitional, the A195, B195, and two, A295. Um, they were done by the AIA pretty early on, but we don't really consider them to totally cover um, IPD. Um, they're very transitional, and so we're not going to discuss those at all. I just want you to know that they're out there and available. Um, the AIA single purpose entity was the AIA's old IPD agreement. Um, they've recently come out with the C191, which is their new agreement, which that was when that one was published in uh, November, I believe, of uh, this past year. Under the C195, though, and I do discuss this in the paper in the comparison um, spreadsheet, but I'm not going to really go over it in the slides. Um, today because, again, we consider this to be the older agreement and we think that the C191 is superior if you're looking for an IPD project. Um, this slide shows the structure. Essentially, under um, the, a, the C195, you form a single purpose entity, which is an LLC, essentially, where the owner, the contractor, and the architect come together, form a separate legal entity, LLC entity, um, which brings up some governance and, well, taxation and capitalization issues, um, as well as licensing. And then the owner would contract separately with the entity, and that agreement is the C-196. And under that agreement, it sets forth the obligations and the rights that the owner has. Um, then the legal entity also contracts with non-owner uh, participants under the C-197. But those are really... We believe that agreement, and it's not super clear, but that agreement, it seems, is for key, key participants like subcontractors or consultants, um, the C197, and not for the architect and the contractor. And that's why you see two gray uh, rectangles up there, because the AIA has not created those other two agreements yet for the architect and the contractor to actually enter into a separate agreement with the uh, separate entity. So that's about all I'm going to say about those. Um, well, I, I lied to you. Here's, here's the C-195. It, you know, as I discussed, it requires a separate legal entity. You've got um, corporate governance under the LLC. It does create some taxation considerations as well as licensing. And also there's capitalization issues because you're forming a separate entity and there's all the paperwork that goes along with that. And as soon as the project is completed, you would dissolve the entity and, and move on. And so this is like a one and done um, type LLC for a specific project. The other issue is that it has a corporate governance and there's an owner, the architect and the owner and the contractor all sit on that governance board for the, for the uh, LLC, but the owner has more votes. So they have a majority under this agreement and they also are the chair of the board. So it, it is slightly, um, the owner has more advantage. Anyway, uh, the architect and the contractor bear the entire risk of cost overrun. It's a GMP in disguise. And um, as I mentioned, there aren't really contracts yet for the architect or the contractor to contract with the entity. So that is all I'm going to say about the C195 series. Um, under the Hanson Bridget IPD model, and this is our basic IPD Howard talked about, you could have uh, compensation being let out at milestones, but this is the deferred compensation until final completion model, and I believe that is included in the materials um, on the website. It's a three-party agreement. The PMT manages and controls the project. The PMT is made up of one member of the architect, the contractor, and the owner, and the party that sits at the designated representative 
for the PMT for each of those parties has to have the ability to bind the company because this is where all the decisions are made. And those decisions must be made unanimously, as Howard discussed, and that's who controls and manages the project throughout. Um, under Hanson Bridget's model, the key subcontractors are specifically mentioned, and they do participate in the incentive compensation layer, and they have a stake in the outcome and the risk of the project if there's overruns. Um, cost and schedule and quality are all tied to the incentive. We, we kind of look at the entire project outcome and we measure all of those things um, as to whether the project was successful or not. Their percentage of profit at risk, you can either put up 100% or if there, you can have a variety on that and you could put up a, per, you know, a lesser percent than 100% of your profit. In most cases on ours, it doesn't seem like people are putting up 100% of their profit. But that, the percent that you put up, it, that is your buffer zone that Howard showed those slides that allows you to have um, a buffer from overruns. We have a streamlined dispute resolution process. We have limited liability because there's waiver, um, as Howard went over. And our agreement is in simple business English format. And things are usually said once. There's not a lot of referral to some other section to talk about the same thing. Um, the AIA C-191 is a fairly good IPD agreement, um, certainly better than the C-195 or the consensus stocks 300s, which I'll get to in a minute. That's the other one that's out there. It's a three-party agreement. One of the differences is there's two levels of management under the AIA agreement. Um, they have a project management team and they have a project executive team. And it's really confusing as to who has the authority for what. I finally concluded that the project management team has the authority for the day-to-day -day operations of the project, and those decisions must be unanimous. And it, it includes a member from the owner, the architect, and the contractor. And those people have to be able to bind the company, so they're pretty high-level people. But anything that has to do with cost or schedule must be approved by the project executive team. Those people also have to be able to bind the company. And so I, that's another thing is I'm not sure how many levels or whether you just have the same people on both teams or how that's really working. Um, and the other thing is, is if the PET or the project executive team does not like the decision that the PMT made, they can override it. So I think that they probably would have been better off if they would have just had one level of management. That's just my personal opinion. I think it confuses the issue a little bit. 100% profit is put at risk under the AIA C-191. Um, and they also have an option, there's a check the box here, where you could put your labor costs at risk. And what they're talking about here is the contractor's general conditions and the architect's allowable costs. So in addition to 100% of your fee being at risk or your profit, the owner can opt and the parties can opt to put your general conditions and your allowable costs at risk as well. They will still pay subcontractor costs. That's not included in the... Uh, labor costs. But of course, depending on when the project takes a turn for the worse, if it does, um, it could, it, the, the contractor is more likely to be impacted because you don't usually overrun something until the end. And if you remember the slide that Howard put up that showed, you know, milestone distributions, usually the architect's going to be mostly paid by then because they're going to have completed their services for the most part. And so more of the contractor would be at risk if they chose the labor cost option. Um, schedule and quality are not specifically tied in anywhere in this agreement. They have goal achievement and arguably you could tie it in there, but they don't really tell you you have to or that, or that you should. So um, I also thought that was a little interesting. And they, they don't discuss key subcontractors and how they are incorporated into this whatsoever. Um, so it's not clear as to whether they're, they have any stake in it. Um, or that they're tied to any of these incentives, which I think kind of misses the point of IPD and, and having those early key people involved so that you can achieve your sustainability goals and your overall cost and schedule goals for the project. Um, they do have limited liability, uh, similar to the Hanson Bridget Agreement, but there's a couple, couple odd things here. 